If you're always gonna hold the past against a man, they can't be their free authentic selves. They have to walk on eggshells. They have to like, oh, maybe I shan't, shouldn't say everything then. If she's freaked out about one thing, I'm gonna hide the rest because there's shame now associated to my past. I've known you for so long. I've known you to be the single guy that was out there. You even said that you used to like, how many women can I sleep with? You've, um, <laughs> you've, you've admitted that you cheated, fought, uh -huh. stole. You were like that yeah. typical um, jock, if you will. Mm -hmm. And now, sitting here in front of me is a man who is extremely open and vulnerable and attached to your heart in a committed relationship, mm -hmm. very secure and confident. Yeah. So what the hell is it that you were able to do that most <clears throat> men can't actually do? Mm. Face myself. Face myself on all the things that I was ashamed of, insecure about, and doubted within myself. And before I started to face these things, I was driven to succeed at all costs driven to look good, uh, driven to fit in, to belong, to be accepted, to be liked, to be loved, driven to compete, and driven to be number one. And that drive was coming from a wound where I was not willing to accept and fully love who I was and all the things I was ashamed of in the past. So I wasn't willing to face myself and take full ownership and responsibility forgive myself and the other people in my life and create new meaning around my entire life. And so it wasn't until I was able to do that, I was driven to succeed and I accomplished success. And I'm all for goals and dreams, but I accomplished a lot of big goals and dreams in sports and then in business, but I still didn't feel loved. I still didn't feel fulfilled. I didn't feel enough. So how much more did I need to succeed in order to feel those things? And it wasn't until I faced myself, and it's been a 10 year journey of facing myself, it's not like it happened overnight, where I realized that, oh, there were a lot of things that I was driven by based on a wound inside of me, an emotional or psychological wound. Well, I lacked a lot of courage, emotional courage in my life. I had courage in certain things, but I lacked emotional courage in relationships, intimacy, whether it be business relationships, family relationships, intimate partners. Mm -hmm. And I lacked the courage out of a wound. And so I would abandon myself, what my values were in order to please others. Again, family relationships, business relationships, intimate relationships. And when people would get upset at me, right? yell at me, scream at me, get upset at me because I didn't do something they expected, whether it was communicated or not. I didn't have the courage or the emotional capacity to communicate of what I was willing to do or not willing to do. I didn't have the courage to sit in the screaming energy and just be like, okay, I hear where you're coming from, but I'm not gonna give in to whatever you need. And so most of my relationships before the last couple of years Anytime someone was not happy with me, I would do whatever I could to create peace and make them happy with me. So I would abandon who I was. I would change who I am. I would adjust my lifestyle. I would adjust my business structure. Whatever it was that they didn't like, I would give in to make them be, be more peaceful. I would do that in family relationships. I would give in if they were upset at me. I would do this with, with friends. I would give in because I didn't want people to not like me. So I lacked the courage to be in the face of someone not liking me and to just say, well, this is who I am. And so I wasn't willing to accept who I was, nor was I willing to be around people who didn't accept me. I had to give in, I had to change, I had to shift. And so I would give in, give in, give in, give in until I didn't recognize myself, mm -hmm. until I was like, who am I? I don't know who I am anymore. I've given in so much for someone else's needs that I've abandoned my own needs. And when I started to be able to reflect on that and realize, oh, this is why I did so many things that I wasn't proud of, or I did things that I would never do, or I did things that don't make sense to me, it's because I really felt trapped and emotionally insecure and without the emotional tools to just stand in the face of someone not liking me. Mm -hmm. It's what it comes down to. So I've had to learn how to face myself 
heal certain wounds inside of me that caused me to abandon who I was in every scenario, mm-hmm. every type of relationship that would cause me to be someone that I'm not, cause me to go uh, to change my identity to make someone okay with me. And I realized that I was repeating that pattern throughout life based on emotional wounds. And a little over two years ago, I started down the journey of kind of next level healing. Because it's been a 10 year journey of healing and and uncovering things, but it was two years ago when I realized, huh, this still isn't working in relationships. I'm, I'm more able to stand my ground in business and family, but intimacy, I still wasn't able to do it. There was something missing in front of me. What do you think that was? I think the, probably the fear of being alone or the fear of like, will I ever find someone, uh, you know, that, that gives me the same type of thing or the fear of, um, yeah, just, you know, people speaking bad about me behind my back because I didn't give them what they wanted. Like every fear that I ever thought of happened, right? Okay, how can I end this relationship peacefully? How can I be in 100% integrity? How can I go to therapy with this person and say, I'm working on this, I'm trying to make this work. And, and my fear was, okay, if I end it, there's going to be a, a shit storm. Mm-hmm. It's going to be chaos. She's going to be angry at me. She's going to be saying things behind my back, which has happened in the past. Some things may be true and some things not true. And so you can't control what other people do or say and how they respond. You can only control how you respond and show up in that situation. And after all this kind of deep, intensive work that I was doing for a number of months, it became clear that um, I needed to stand up for myself and be there for me and not always put everyone else first. So I was neglecting who I was and the things that I valued. And once I did that and started to get the courage on how to do that consistently, everything shifted for me. The fear is, you know, what if this doesn't work out? What if people, you know, make fun of me? What if people laugh at me? What if people think badly of me? What if, pe- what if this hurts my business? What if this hurts my relationships? But when I was able to face those things, it set me free. And when I said, I am good with me, this is my values, this is my vision, this is my life, and I cannot keep giving in to make one person happy in order to make me unhappy. I can't give in over and over and over again to try to create peace for someone who doesn't have peace within them. You cannot buy peace, you must be peace in all situations. And that means standing in the face of people being upset at you constantly for not giving them what they want. And and I just realized that I had chosen poorly in all my relationships. All the people that I'd been with in the past, they're all fine people, you know, and I wish them all the success and I'm happy for their journey. They just weren't the right match for me and I wasn't the right match for them. Mm. And that's why with Martha, when we met, I just said to myself, never again will I abandon myself for any human being ever. It doesn't mean I'm not gonna show up fully and give and you know sacrifice and make, make big commitments, but I will never abandon who I am at my highest version of myself. And with Martha, as we were getting in you know, our dating experience before we committed to a relationship, I was so upfront and honest with her about who I am, about my whole past, and about where I'm going. And I'm not gonna be in a relationship unless someone else fully accepts who I am. That means you have to accept all of me, my past, my present, and what my vision is for my future. And that means you can't change me. You cannot try to change me. But what I will tell you is that I'm on a constant growth journey. I do emotional coaching every two weeks. I will show up, and we also committed to joint therapy together when we got committed. I said, this is something that I want. She said, I want that as well. So we agreed on doing this together to just minimize confusion or arguments or anything like that and create agreements. And I said, I'm going to tell you the truth about everything, but you're not going to like it. You're not going to like it because I've told the truth to previous people and they freak out. They scream, they go crazy. They, you know, start crying. They can't handle it. So most women have shown me that they cannot handle the truth. And when you say truth, can I dig a little deeper on what you mean? Truth about who I am, accepting who the person is that they're with. But what was it then in the past where people Mm -hmm. would scream and not accept it and freak out? Like I- My priorities. Ah. 
Because I'm picturing in my head, my people, if I can just be honest, yeah, how many yeah. women you've slept with. Like, no. that's where I just go straight to because well, women I think, do. I think women stress about hearing about past experiences exactly. of what men have done. Yeah. And if you can't accept what someone has gone mm-hmm. through, then you shouldn't be with them. Mm-hmm. If you're always going to hold the past against a man, they can't be their free, authentic selves. They have to walk on eggshells. They have to like, oh, maybe I shan't, shouldn't say everything then. If she's freaked out about one thing, I'm going to hide the rest because there's shame now associated to my past. And one of the things that's uh, about the greatness mindset versus a powerless mindset in relationships and in life is when you conceal past pains, you are powerless. You are in a powerless state of mind. You're not in a greatness mindset. And so if you do that in intimacy and relationships, if you conceal past pains, you can't reveal who you are to your partner. That means you're a victim, you're afraid, you're living in a fear mindset, and it makes you more powerless. But when I am fully authentic about my entire past and I reveal everything at the right timing and pace and you know all these things, not in the first day. <laughs> you don't just vomit on but them when, everything. But when, I, but when it's asked and I say, are you sure you want the truth? And she says, yes. I go, are you sure you want the truth? Because you may not want to hang out with me after this. And she says, why is that? Well, because based on my experience, no woman in the past has been able to hear my truth without freaking out, screaming, crying, throwing a fit, throwing a tamper tantrum, making me wrong and bad. And no man wants to be wrong and bad. And she said, she had one of the, one of the, the questions she asked me was, you know, after a few weeks of us being hanging out or whatever, Lewis, what's your priorities in life? You know, the priorities question that every man gets at some point from a person they're dating. And with Martha, I was just like, okay, we're, we're probably not gonna, you're not gonna hang out with me anymore once you hear this. And we're probably not gonna be, you know, maybe we're friends, maybe not. And I, and all, I get to be clear that not everyone is for me in the world. And as a, as a, a wounded boy who didn't have friends and, and reinforced stories in situations that reinforce that belief that it's no fun to be alone and have people make fun of you and pick on you, like that belief stuck with me until I started to heal it. And so I, and I got to a place with her, I was like, man, this is an incredible woman. But if we're not the right match, it's okay. I'm gonna be who I am and I'm gonna be single and I'll be fine. And I was just like, I'll never abandon myself again. So when she said, what's your priorities? I said, well, every woman wants to hear that they're number one, that they are the number one priority of every man and you'll never be number one. Now, let me give you context because that might be harsh if that's like a clip taken out of context, but I put women first before and it never worked. I would abandon myself. I'd give them everything they want. I would change who I was to put them first, their needs, their feelings, their fears first. And that does not work. So instead I said, I will never put one person first. I will put my health first. My number one priority is my health, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual. And that means that if we choose to be in a relationship together, you can never take my health away from me. You can never try to say, don't go to the gym, don't go to coaching, don't go to therapy. Uh, I don't want you doing this. You can never pull me away from my time. That doesn't mean I need 10 hours a day, but you need to be honoring my time for my health and be in support of me being the healthiest version that I can be. That's my number one priority. Women don't want to hear that. Number two priority, you won't be it. And women don't want to be number, uh, not number two either. So women don't like that. They don't like to say, wait, I'm not your number one or number two priority. No, my number two priority is my mission. My mission right now is where I feel called inside of me, the voice inside of me, whatever it is, God, a voice, something calling me forward to do something that I feel I'm, I'm destined to do for this season of my life. And a man without a mission is a scary man. A man who is not on his purpose is a, has more potential to be harmful than good. So you want a man on his purpose. You want a man at least having a clear direction of where he's going. And that purpose can't be you. It can't only be you. It, it, you can oh, be a, only? It can be a part of you, but right. that can't be you. It can be, yes, I want to be the best father, the best husband, the best you know, uh, leader I can be. You know, family is extremely valuable and important, but there has to be something else as well that he's doing to be of service to the family. It's from my personal experience. And so I said, uh, my purpose, 
and my mission is going to be my, my second priority. And I need my health to be number one so I have the energy mm -hmm. and the focus to focus on my mission and my purpose. Now, that may change in 10 years. It may be changed in five years. I don't know. But right now, this is my mission, to serve 100 million lives weekly to help them improve the quality of their life. That's the mission I'm on. So I need my partner to be full alignment that you can't take me away from my mission. You can't say, I need you to come home at this time. I need this. I need this. Don't go to this trip. No, I need you to fully support and embrace this is who I am at this season of life. Mm -hmm. And if you're telling me I need to change who, my, who I am and my mission, then I'm going to resent you. I'm going to resent the relationship. I'm going to get frustrated. We're going to have problems. Mm -hmm. So do you want me to be in full harmony and integrity in this relationship or do you want there to be problems? The third priority is you. And here's the thing. I told her, I said, if you understand number one and two are my biggest priorities, you will feel like number one every moment. Mm. You will feel like you're the number one priority because I'm going to be so present with you. I'm going to be so appreciative of you daily. I'm going to give unconditionally. I'm going to support you and elevate you like you've never been lifted up in your life. If you understand, you cannot mess with one and two. Because you can't do that for her unless you do number one and 100%. two. hundred percent. And so it's all around context of, and she knows that she is, again, she feels like the number one priority because she supports me in one and two. And what was her response to that? Her response was, yes, thank you. And I was thinking like, okay, this is done. <laughs> yeah. She was like, yes. She goes, I am so happy to hear this. And I go, I was kind of confused and, and th thinking she was joking because every other woman I'd been with would like cry or be upset or be like insecure or, uh, you know, give me the cold shoulder for a day or two or whatever. And so I'd be like, okay, well, uh, I'll make you number one. You know, it's like I would give in. She was like, yes, thank you. And I go, really? I was like, you like that? She goes, yes, this is incredible because I've never met a man with a purpose. They always made me their purpose. And I was like, no, but what's the thing you want to do in the world? What's the thing that calls you that you're supposed to go do every day. I don't care if you make money or not, but like at least be on a mission to do something. Sing, dance, create art, whatever it is, go do something daily. Don't make me number one. Make you and your mission number one. And they always made her the number one priority and it never worked out. And so for me, it's about creating conscious relationship, being very clear that we are coming together in alignment to serve one another, but to make sure that our health and our purpose is also a very high priority. Mm -hmm. And so I told her before I got committed, after I knew that she could accept me for who I was about my priorities. So me being clear and honest and open about this is me and what I'm gonna do. And I'm not gonna change for you or anyone unless I wanna change, but not because you want me to. I said, I want us to do joint therapy from the start. And our coach has been doing like 35 years of, of therapy and coaching. And she's like, I've never met a couple at the beginning do therapy together when everything was perfect on mm. honeymoon. And I said, well, I just don't want to fall into the same pattern where, okay, a year, two years goes down. You don't have the conversations you need to have. And then there's arguments and there's disruption and you've already intertwined so much. So let's minimize that and just try to create agreements from the start. So there's less confusion and distraction. And be honest about everything, about money, life, sex, kids, everything from the start. So we're in alignment. There's no, there's no confusion. And I also said, uh, I want us to do that. And she was like, I want us to do that. So let's do it. So we both agreed on therapy together from the beginning. It's been beautiful. And then I said, before we get committed, I'm going to let you know that I accept you fully. And I had to ask myself a question. Is there any insecurity inside of me? Because most men, I used to be very insecure and jealous prior to 10 years ago. Something inside of me like killed the jealousy bug probably like seven, eight years ago where jealousy left my body. Where did it stem from originally? And then how did it leave your body? Because this is, Lewis, if we can help people with the jealousy man, thing, this is the thing that I think breaks up so many relationships. I have zero jealousy. Like, I, to be honest, Martha can do whatever she wants and she can hang out with anyone she wants. We have agreements where she's not going to put herself in a situation that's uncomfortable for right. me. But I don't care if she takes meeting with guys, if she's she's on set with like shirtless guys, she's making out with guys. That's what I was going to say. People that may not know, she's an actress. She's a, and... she's a massive superstar, massive superstar in Mexico. She, she can't walk down the street without people stopping her. Men want her. Women love her. 
And, and she has the most generous giving heart. So she's such a lover of people. Mm -hmm. So she'll take time and hug people and connect with people and all that stuff. And I don't know if 15 years ago, I would have been able to sit with that knowing that there's all these superstar men that she's friends with and all these billionaires mm -hmm. want to take her out on dates and everyone's offering her private jets to come around and hang out with her and go dates with her and celebrities and royalty. And, and I'm like, I could care less. Okay, let, let, let's please, let's go down this yeah. rabbit hole because this is so strong because even with all the things that you even just repeated, right? Well, they were wealthy and they had the six packs <laughs> abs and it goes to show the types of insecurities we have, yeah. right? That if, and mine is like, well, she had big boobs, she had a beautiful butt, right. right? So it's like the things that we maybe are insecure in ourselves, we see that maybe if they're around, they're going to find that interesting yeah. because we don't have it. So take me back to you and said 15 years ago. Yeah. If that had happened, what would have happened? How would that have um, uh, manifested into your behavior? Oh, and man. then where did it come from? One of the biggest fallacies is that relationships shouldn't be work. Say what? We put time, effort, and hard work into growing our careers or our business, but love should just happen? After 20 years of being married, all stars were being willing to ask and answer hard questions. I have a free downloadable PDF for you for a happy, successful, lasting love. Click the link below for free access to the most important questions you must ask your partner, PDF. I, I would've just been so insecure and been like, oh, who, where are you? Who are you hanging out with? Like you know, show me the messages or whatever. Okay, I would have just been yeah. like very like insecure. Very insecure and needing it to be all about me mm. because I lacked the emotional tools and I lacked the, again, I hadn't faced myself yet. This is why it goes back mm -hmm. to the beginning. Like I finally started to face myself 10 years ago. And it's been a journey of facing myself in many different areas of life that have taken time. Um, but I think it was the, the fear of being alone, the fear of like not being enough, the fear of not being good enough, the fear of, not being talented enough, smart enough, and there's gonna be someone else that's gonna make the girls that I was with, mm -hmm. you know, happier or something, right? So I would, it all comes down to I am not enough. Mm -hmm. And it all shifted when I started to say I am enough. And I started to recognize how much enough I actually am and what I am willing to accept and what I'm willing to not accept and to be okay alone. I really had to learn how to go on dates by myself. And I did this for many, many years where I was just like, okay, I'm afraid to be alone, so I need to go be alone as frequently as possible. So I would go to dinner by myself in order for one. I would go to movies alone and sit by myself. Uh, were you uncomfortable as you're doing this? First, yeah, the first you know, few months of this, I was like terrified. I was like, what are people thinking about me? And do I even like my own company? And mm -hmm. you know, all these things. And then I was just like, no, nah. I would practice this over and over again. As I, as I went to New York City, I would go to the park by myself alone. I would go on walks by myself. I would just like date myself. And it was one of the best exercises I learned. And it took a couple years of doing that until I felt like, oh, okay, the jealousy has left my body. And I think it was, I don't know, yes, yeah, six, seven years ago, eight years ago when I realized I'm not jealous anymore. Because one of the girls that I was dating like, I can't remember what happened. She did something with a guy that was like, huh, that maybe would have made me upset in the past. Mm -hmm. They were hanging out and I just felt nothing. And I was like, huh, maybe I'm just mature. Maybe I'm growing. Maybe I'm developing, healing. It was kind of like a journey of all of it. And it has set me free. Letting go of jealousy has set me free because if Martha wants to be with someone else, then be with someone else. Mm -hmm. If someone makes is a better fit for you, why would I want to rob you of a better aligned relationship and a better life for you? If I don't provide that, that doesn't mean I'm bad, wrong, and not enough. It just means we're not aligned and we're not the right match. And that's okay. There's 8 billion people in the world. I'm sure there could be another person that would be a better match if she didn't think I was a good fit. So it would be on her if she didn't think I was a good fit, but I'm not going to change who I am. And that's why I said when, I, when we started getting committed, I said, I... I'm going to fully accept you. And I told her, um, I'm not going to get upset at you. I might be like frustrated, but I'm not going to get upset at you. I'm never going to raise my voice at you because there's nothing you could do that could upset me. If I accept who you are at your core 
and we create agreements together, if you break the agreement, I know you're gonna take full ownership and responsibility. We, we have flexibility. It's not like mm -hmm. it's so strict. If you break an agreement or I break an agreement, we're gonna take ownership. We're consistently growing together in emotional coaching together and I do it individually and you do it. So as long as we stay ag agree on these terms, why would I need to be jealous? Why would I need to be upset at you? Why would I need to say, don't do this? And so I told her, um, I fully accept you and I won't get angry at you. And you can ask her, I've never gotten upset at her. It doesn't mean we don't have challenging conversations. It yeah. doesn't mean there hasn't been sad moments. It doesn't mean there's been like letdowns from both of us, but we both are in agreement that we're in this together and we are in alignment together of how to communicate, conscious communication. Mm -hmm. So we set boundaries about when we communicate about challenging things. And it's, again, it's a constant journey, but when I fully accept who she is and she fully accepts who I am, it's a game changer. And so I had to ask myself, okay, here's a massive celebrity. Here's a person who's done 40 movies, who's a superstar in Mexico and big, becoming bigger around the world. She's only gonna become more famous. More men are gonna desire her more and more. She's only gonna be a, a rising star, especially because I'm just gonna keep lifting her up and giving her more energy because I want her to succeed. So when that happens, am I, and she's done kissing scenes and sex scenes, not, not like little sex scenes, but she's done movie it's scenes. It's not porn, but it's sex yes, scenes. <laughs> it's like intimate, like yeah, bedroom course, yeah. scenes with other men in the past. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some of them. And I remember being like, huh, this bothered me. I had to really check in. And there's a little bit of ego that's like, oh, that, that's my woman, right? That's my, that's my girl and this person's doing this. But I had to, maybe that was for t literally 10 seconds. But again, if I'm coming from my ego self as opposed to my conscious self, mm. I, in my conscious self, I know this is art. This is an artistic expression. I also know there's 50 people in the room. I also know it's mechanical. I also know it's about telling a story. And she is a storyteller. So why would I change who she is when it brings her the most joy and love in her life? So I had to say to myself, okay, I know this might be a thing you do in the future. Um, do I accept that? When we have kids and you do that, is that gonna be okay for me? I had and your to go kids th turning around and saying, daddy, why oh, yeah. is mommy kissing Making out this guy. guy. Yeah, this yeah. like shredded 25 year old or whatever. Yeah. Right? And so I, have to, I had to ask mm -hmm. myself all these future questions mm -hmm. and say, will I accept and fully love her even when she does these things for her art? Mm -hmm. If she did it in life differently, that's a different story. That wouldn't work. But for her artistic expression, her, her vision for her life. And I was like, yeah, I fully accept it. And I also fully accept that she is gonna take care of the relationship, that she's gonna put herself in the right situations. She's going to choose stories mm -hmm. that align to her life and, her, and our relationship. And if she makes out with a guy, then she makes out with a guy. And I would have never been able to say that 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Yeah. But otherwise, I'm, try, I'm saying I do not accept who you are and I'm trying to change who you are. That means I don't fully love you if I'm trying to change you and I don't accept you. So I need to overcome whatever I'm going through and say, yes, I accept you or no, I don't wanna be in this relationship. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. If you don't accept someone you're with, don't be with them. And if they don't accept you, then why are you guys together? Like, Have you worked through that because I love everything you're saying, but we all know there's a massive difference between, okay, knowing it and be like, look, this is yeah. your art form. I respect it. I support it. And there's a whole other thing, Lewis, with you standing there behind the cameras <laughs> when your woman <laughs> is just like really making out with this hot guy. Yeah. Because you, I hear you talk about triggers a lot and how mm -hmm. you've actually worked on your triggers yes. and making sure that you're unwiring your triggers. And so as you were talking, I literally go, oh, I can completely see that you've done all the preparation work that you're like, I understand uh -huh. why. But then when you're standing on set, the trigger, by definition, is a trigger, right? Where it like yeah. overcomes the mental part and just gives you a visceral uh, reaction. You gotta heal the triggers. I mean, this has been a journey for the last couple of years of really healing the emotional triggers that used to uh, hurt me. And if something is triggering you mm -hmm. where there's an external event and you feel a reaction quickly, I'm not saying you can't be upset about something or be frustrated or not like something, but when it triggers you to react from a, a a fight or flight standpoint, 
that means your nervous system has not healed a wound that was once opened. So when we have a wound and it stays open for decades sometimes, it's always gonna be affected when someone's poking it or when something happens and it pokes it. This happened to me for so long. And it was a powerless mindset because I had wounds that I was unwilling to face and heal. So therefore, I was still a loving, happy, fun guy, but when I felt the trigger of abuse, abandonment, take advantage of, I would get in this defense mode, I would get in this reaction mode, I would not be conscious in my communication, I would respond in frustrated ways. And it doesn't mean I have to like what's happening, but it's our response which is important, and to be aware of our triggers. So really, there's nothing that Martha has done that has triggered me, that I can think of, because we do emotional coaching individually and we do it together as well. Mm -hmm. We work on these things together. We process them together. We heal together. We mend together. And it allows for peace and harmony in the relationship. And I probably wouldn't be on set if she was making out with a guy. I wouldn't put myself okay. in that situation. Know thyself? Yeah, I would just be like, okay, have a great day. And I wouldn't want to be sitting there watching it for like eight hours, you know, because it's a long day of doing that. But I would, um, I would just trust her. I would trust her. And if she breaks trust, that's her being out of integrity. Just like if I broke the trust, that's on me. I would have to live with that. That does not feel good. I know what that feels like. She would have to live with that. That is suffering internally. Living a lie, being out of integrity is suffering. And the more you build that, you do that, you lose confidence in yourself. You lose the ability to be authentic. And so we have these conversations all the time. If she does something out of integrity, I'll eventually find out about it. And then we'll address it. We'll see if there's a way to, to process it together and make things work, or we'll move on. Mm -hmm. And we're both clear that that's what will happen. And so why am I trying to cling on to something and be so obsessive and jealous and possessive of a person? Because that's not going to help bring peace and love and harmony in the relationship. So doing that hurts a relationship, so why do it? If you're doing it to think, well, I don't want someone to... to to cheat on me or to see another man or to be outside without me there, then it's like, if you aren't confident with yourself in the relationship, then you gotta take a look at that. And that was me for many, many years in many relationships. And so this is not a judgment or a make wrong of anyone. This is just, you have gotta learn to face yourself and know where you're at. And I don't see a world where you can do everything on your own at a high level. I just don't know any great athlete that made it there without a coach. Uh, you know, when Jordan and, and LeBron and Kobe won the, their first championship, they didn't say, thank you coaches for the last 25, 30 years for getting me here. I don't need a coach anymore because I figured it out now. <laughs> I'm gonna go win the championship next year on my own without a coach. No athlete has ever said this and executed at a high level without a coach. Most people cannot do anything great on their own without support, coaches, mentors, guides. And especially when it comes to our emotions, I just think it's so valuable to have support. Whether this is a personal friend, an accountability buddy, a coach, a therapist, a guide, I just think it's so important to have someone who can give you support and guide you through your emotions. That's why I've got a coach and I see her almost every two weeks, even when things are great. I keep going because I want to elevate to the next level. I love that. And it aligns with your uh, number one priority yes. of making sure that you're very in tune, aligned. So you've actually mentioned multiple times about identifying the traumas from childhood mm -hmm. and not feeling enough. If you don't mind actually sharing some of those, yeah. because again, like the thing that, one of many things that I freaking adore about you is how open and vulnerable mm -hmm. you are about your childhood and how important it is because there isn't enough men. Like I sit here right now, I have a whole show called Women of Impact. So I'm always talking about all the things we've been yeah. taught that's actually hurt us, but we don't often ask the men. We don't often yeah. say like, in today's interview, by the way, it's been so profound for me because what I really wanted to do is show that even if there is someone's either in a relationship where a guy maybe isn't showing up the way that they want them to, whether they've dated guys and they've just been, you know, uh, dismissive, they kind of just use them for sex, yes. whatever. 
it doesn't necessarily make them bad people. Mm -hmm. It may just make them wounded people. 100%. And the way, if we can understand that and really communicate, I think that we end up bringing the genders together instead of it being, right. well, he cheated on me. Well, she's a bitch. Well, she's right. a, you know, like there's no more finger pointing. <laughs> well, this is my, this is something I love to talk about. Not my, not my wounds or anything, but just, I just believe a lot of men are suffering. They're suffering in silence internally and they're, causing loud noises externally mm. through their suffering, through their anger, reaction, their, their harm, their, um, just what they're doing in the world. You know, there's a, most of the mass shootings are from men and these men are suffering. I'm not saying what they do is okay. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not agreeing with any of their actions, uh, but I can see where it's coming from. I can see the anger and the suffering. And where does anger come from? It comes from a wound. It comes from a wound that has yet to be healed. And so when you feel so much pain inside and you have not figured out how to mend and create new meaning from past memories, that's when you start to react and unleash in different ways, whether it be in intimacy and in relationships, you close off, you can't look at your partner in the eyes, you can't be vulnerable, you can't cry in front of your partner, you can't do certain things because you don't feel safe because you feel afraid. So it comes back to the triggers. I believe that the wounds cause the most pain if we don't know how to mend them. So I'll just, I mean, briefly go over some of the stuff with me. I mean, I was, one of my first memories is of sexual abuse from a man that I did not know in a bathroom. Babysitter's uh, house, uh, her son was about 16 or 17, took me to the bathroom and sexually abused me. That's you one of my first- five at the time, it's five. Right? I mean, it's one of my first memories. If you don't have a way to heal that and you just keep living life, that memory is gonna keep replaying or you're gonna somehow block a part of yourself. And how long did you not tell anyone about 25 that? years. So 25 years of that, but it was also that stacked on a lot of the stuff. And this is not to say I had you know more trauma than other people. This is not a, a trauma competition game, but just to give context, you know, my brother went to prison when I was eight for four and a half years. So I would visit a prison cell, not a cell, but the visiting room almost every weekend for four and a half years. And so from eight to 12 and a half, I really wasn't allowed to have friends. I didn't have any friends. Because growing up in a small town in Ohio, this didn't really happen in my neighborhood. And so other parents wouldn't let their kids hang out with me. And so I don't blame my brother for any of this. This is just the scenario that happened, right? And what I experienced. And it was all beautiful things for me for my future. But that was kind of tormenting, you know, for most of my childhood until I was 13, I experienced a couple of these things. And I also just had a very unstable home life. My parents didn't show love to each other. They, I knew they loved us kids, but they weren't able to show each other love. And in fact, it was a lot of passive aggressive energy, a lot of yelling, screaming, slamming, physical fights. Um, and so I just felt like I was afraid always, a low level of fear about what's going to happen to me. Um, and I was in the bottom of my class, so I didn't have like any skills in school. So I was academically just struggling. And so I was afraid to just stand in front of a group of, of peers without them laughing at me because I really couldn't read and write until I got to be older. I still struggle reading aloud today. And so this was just like part of the childhood that, that made me driven to succeed to try to fulfill a hole in a wound inside of me that I was not enough. Again, there are three main fears that cause us to doubt ourselves in life, in relationships, in our career, whatever it might be. Three main fears. And self-doubt, I believe, is the killer of all dreams. And these three fears cause us to doubt ourselves the most. This is the fear of failure, the fear of success, and the fear of judgment. And at the root of each one of these fears is I am not enough. And when we can go back to the memories where the wounds are that we have not healed yet, and start to mend those and create new meaning, then we can start to turn I am not enough to I am enough. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a journey of healing. And so 25 years, I held on to really all that pain, all the shame, all the pain, and those wounds drove me to be successful, drove me to get angry and be jealous when girlfriends would do certain things, drove me to be worried and stressed out, drove me to stay up hours every night ruminating, and I didn't know why I couldn't sleep. And it wasn't until within 
days after I opened up about sexual trauma for the first time. Again, the powerless mindset is you conceal past pains. You aren't willing to reveal these things. That means you're ashamed. That doesn't mean you have to reveal them to the world, but you need to be okay with revealing them to someone. And when I finally opened up about one traumatic experience, the sexual abuse, I finally was able to sleep at night without staying up for hours every night. I could finally like put my head down and sleep within minutes. And it completely shifted everything. And so these, it's been a 10 year healing journey of going back and healing different memories uh, that caused me to feel resentful, angry, jealous, you know, frustrated, shameful, all these things. And it's probably gonna be a continual journey forever as life happens and events that happen and we create new meaning. But when I was able to go back and really, I mean, I did a process two years ago where I had a photo of my five-year-old self on my screensaver for about six months. And I had a, a new relationship with my five-year-old self, which might sound a little weird, but I, I parented myself the way that I needed to. I parented the wounds and the memories the way that I needed to back then, right now. And I would do sessions with myself, as weird as it sounds. I would do sessions with my five-year-old self, imagining my five-year-old self is standing right in front of me. I'd talk to him. How are you feeling, little Lewis? What's going on? What are you worried about? What are you scared of? And he was able to express what he was afraid of for the first time, as opposed to holding on to it and just trying to be tougher and just figure life out. And as I created a new relationship with my inner child, I was able to hug myself and embrace myself and say, I got you. I'm so proud of you for how you overcame these things. I'm so inspired by what you went through and you got us here. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for doing what it took to get us here, even though you were confused and scared and not sure why you were even alive and not sure why these things were happening to you. Thank you. You got us here. I'm so proud of how strong you were. And now you can let it go. And I brought him into my heart spiritually and reconnected from a place of healing and wholeness. And I started doing that at my 12 year old self when I would steal all the time and started to have a new relationship with my 12 year old self. So I had a photo of myself when I was 12. I did this for my 17 year old self. I've done this all the way through to all the past 10 years up until now. And it has given me so much peace of going back and healing those wounds and creating new meaning around why those events happened. You know, Man's Search for Meaning is one of my favorite books with Viktor Frankl, and he lived one of the happiest, joyful, fulfilling lives after going through one of the most horrific things in the concentration camp. And all this comes back to is creating new meaning from these memories. It doesn't how mean- How do you do that though? Like, how do you actually go back? Like, as you were talking, I was trying so hard not to cry mm. because, because it breaks my heart to think about that five-year-old boy yeah. right now and all the trauma he's having to maybe deal with, the shame, the not speaking up, that's gonna be 25 years before yeah. he even recognizes it, that then has all these turbulent other relationships, lies, cheats, and blah, blah, blah. And we look at him as like, well, he's a problem child, you know, or he's just a player. And you dismiss, you just dismiss him. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know the stats, I'm gonna make them up. It's something like one in five guys. One in six. One in six. Sexually are, abused, yeah. And then how many people say it? Zero, like very few. You're yeah. almost like the only guy yeah, that I know has been so open about it. Very few. And so how on earth did you create meaning for that five-year-old boy? <sighs> I mean, again, I, I don't think I could have done it on my own. Yeah. That's why I had emotional coaches, mm -hmm. therapists. I did meditation retreats. I did lots of different healing modalities. I mean, I've tried so many different things in the past 10 years from breathing exercises to Wim Hof and cold rivers in Poland to going to India mm -hmm. for weeks at a time to study meditation to neuroscience meditation with Joe Dispenza to different therapists to emotional intelligence workshops. I felt like for me, it's been a journey of each modality adding something to me and unlocking a new mm -hmm. opportunity for growth. There's not some one thing that's like cured everything and it's always a, a journey of healing. It's never a one-time moment. But the thing that has worked for me is the consistent emotional coaching every couple of weeks. And I see the power of preventative care, like going to the gym and making sure that the, 
the bigger my platform gets, the more opportunities I have for people to critique me, I want to prepare myself to not be emotionally triggered. Mm -hmm. I want to prepare myself for potential letdowns and not being exhausted for weeks because I don't know how to manage my emotions. And so emotional coaching or therapy has supported me in just constantly showing up for myself and processing it. Here's the thing, once you are aware of it and you face it, you've got to practice it because the nervous system will bring you back into stress. Mm -hmm. And so I practiced this in a previous relationship where I was in couples therapy, trying to make the relationship work. And at one point I was like, told the, the coach, I go, I'm done. I got to get out of this relationship. I cannot deal with this stress anymore. It doesn't work for me. I'm done. And she was just like, I don't think you're ready yet. To break up. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I go, oh, does this person just want more money from me? You know, I was just like, I was like, <laughs> oh, I was re I was like oh. angry. I was like, mm -hmm. but I don't want to be in this anymore. I don't like this anymore. And she said, I hear you. And we still have work to do. And if you get out now before you've really mended certain things and you can create peace in the chaos, as opposed to running away from the chaos, but create peace in the chaos, not abandoning yourself in the stress, you'll probably, most likely, repeat the pattern. What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confident workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. Interesting. Jill, the next person, you still haven't faced it fully. And it needs to be in the relationship while you're doing her. Huh? That was her yeah, that was fascinating. strategy, right? And I was like, I just want freedom. I want peace. I want to get out of this. I can't mm -hmm. deal with this anymore. It doesn't work for me. She goes, I get it. But you still are abandoning yourself in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So when are you going to learn to not abandon yourself? Mm -hmm. And just saying, I'm done without facing the problems head on. She's like, you cannot buy peace. You must become peace. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to stay in this forever. You're not trapped. You don't have to be in this for the next year. But you got to learn certain things in the face of adversity besides running away from it. Mm -hmm. And I go, oh, I'm so done with this, though. I just want to be out of it. And I think it was probably the best thing for me. I'm not saying this for everyone, because I think if you are really afraid of your life, you should get out of a relationship. Right. Don't stay in anything if you are truly in fear. Um, but for me, I decided to give it a couple more months until I was able to stand for my inner child in every moment in a conscious, calm way. So when she would scream or react or not speak to me for three days or whatever she was, or make me wrong or judge me or put me down, I just say, you know, this isn't in an alignment with what we've agreed to in our, our couples therapy of the vision that I have for our relationship of loving communication. So I'm gonna remove myself from this situation. I'm gonna go in the other room calmly and you let me know when you're ready to talk. But this doesn't work for me, for the vision I have anymore. When you started to change then and talk to her in that she way- She fucking hated it. I literally was about to say she, guaranteed. She tried to punish me more mm. for not giving in, for mm. not giving her what she wanted, for not doing, for not checking, be like, oh, it's okay, I'll give you what you want. Oh, I'm sorry, okay, here's this, here's money, here's this, or whatever you need. She did not like me being a loving, passionate, wise man. So how on earth, because you even said, like your therapist said, you know, you need to learn how to create yes. um, peace within chaos. So you're trying to create peace, but it actually then creates more chaos. Of course, which makes you want to go back to your old right? way of being. Yeah. And I, I just was like, because I got to a place where I was like, all right, I am clear that this relationship will either work out the way I need it to with mm -hmm. my vision of a conscious relationship or we won't be together. And either way, I'm fine with that. And so I just got to be so, but I was like, but I will not allow myself to abandon myself ever again in this relationship or any relationship, because that's not working for me. It's causing a pain in my chest consistently, and I don't want this pain anymore. And so the more I did this, there was a period of time in therapy where this ball of pain that I had for years 
disintegrated. And you're touching your heart. Was it really? It was like right in my chest. Yeah. It was like this pain yeah. that would kind of come and go. Some weeks it was more intense. Other weeks it wasn't there. It almost felt like a clenching in my throat as well because mm. I felt trapped. Mm. I felt emotionally trapped. And this pain was intensifying. And um, there was one day in therapy where it was like after months of, again, facing myself, of going back and creating new meaning, of reflecting on all my parents' behaviors and their model of love and relationships. That's where it all stems from. I realized that I was a free man, but I never felt free. Mm -hmm. And the first moment I met with my coach, she was like, what's your intention for our time working together? And I said, I want peace, freedom, and clarity, because I feel like I have none of it in this relationship. And all I want is peace, freedom, and clarity. And I wasn't being those things, because I felt like I was a trapped human being mm -hmm. emotionally. And it wasn't until I was able to mend and heal these wounds from the past where I became peace, free, and clear. I was becoming that, and it disintegrated. That, that old memory, that old trauma disintegrated throughout my body, and it felt like a lightness. It felt like I was free. So the next time these events would happen in the relationship, I would just say, I, would, I, would, I didn't have the trigger anymore. Again, the wound, when it happens, I'd be triggered and say, oh, how can I fix it? So now when a scream, an attack, a make wrong, a judgment, a blame came at me, I was able to see it from a different point of view. And I could look at it and say, okay, I don't like this. I don't like someone judging me or blaming or screaming at me, but I'm not reactive. As of before, I was reactive. And now I'm calm because I am a free man emotionally. I am a clear man. I am a peaceful man. So I do not need to react and give in to one person who's blaming, making wrong, screaming at me, judging me, comparing me, whatever. All the things, giving me the cold shoulder, the silent mm. treatment, everything that used to cause me stress and a trigger. Now I notice it and say, okay, that's just who she's being. That's who she is. And that's out of alignment with what I wanna create for a conscious relationship. She knows what my vision is for our relationship. She knows what a conscious relationship looks like. And she's not willing to live up to that standard that I want to live up to now. And I was just being a stand for my inner child and my vision, my vision of a conscious life and a conscious relationship. And there are certain distinctions of a conscious relationship. And if someone isn't agreeing to that, then that doesn't make them bad or wrong. They're just not what I want. And that's okay. So it's learning to accept someone and say, okay, we're not the right fit or accept them and say we are. And uh, the journey of healing, it's funny, I got a message from, uh, I was telling you before offline that I was, I've been to a few different, I've been to many prisons because uh, I would visit prisons a lot when I was a kid to visit my brother. Mm -hmm. And I've been here uh, in LA, there's some prisons nearby. I've been a few times um, because my, my book, The Masking Masculinity, has been kind of shared out throughout some prisons. And I believe that you know when men heal, the world heals. There's a lot of men who are in suffering and in pain, which causes them to do harm to others, causes them to, to do things out of alignment with mm -hmm. the law and all sorts of things and the harmony of human beings. And all these things get to be taken accounted for and responsibility for. Um, but if we want the, the world to really evolve and change in a place of peace and love, then we gotta get men to find peace and love within themselves mm -hmm. and harmony. And I just got a message from, I did a, a speech to all the prisons during the pandemic about the mask and masculinity. They were streaming it live wow. to all the prisons about these different masks that men wear that caused them to project an image mm. in life, relationships, friends, sports, everything, business, to fit in, to belong, to feel accepted and to feel enough. Because most of the time we put on masks as men because we believe if someone truly knew everything about me, they would not love me. If my woman truly knew this about me, she wouldn't accept me. She wouldn't love me. So we have this fear of not being enough. And I got a message from um, my friend, Scott Budnick, who runs these prison programs for men. He sent me a text with a six page letter from an inmate who watched this. And the text said, um, I met this kid a couple years ago. Um, when he got into prison, he was 21. He was a part of a white gang and he had a swastika, swastika tattooed to his chest. Oh 
and he's been in solitary confinement for two years. That means you get an hour a day outside and then you're alone for 30, 23 hours. And he said, um, he sent me this six page letter. He just showed me a text with a letter. He sent it to me. And in the letter, he said, I dropped out of the gang. I'm starting to heal my heart. And he said, when he asked him why, he said, Lewis Howes and the Mask of Masculinity. I've read this book four times. I'm finally realizing why I was so reactive in life. Why the things that caused me to react and do the things that I did wrong. So for me, the greatness mindset really stems down to learning how to navigate and heal your heart, heal your emotions, because these things work together. Our thoughts and our emotions affect our actions. And if we are living in so much pain, we're going to hurt our partners, our friends, our family. We're going to do bad things to humanity if we don't have love for, in our hearts and peace in our hearts. And so that's why, you know, I'm on a mission to support all human beings in finding that healing and peace because I know what's available on the other side and I know how much pain and suffering it is when you don't have it. And like you said, one in six men have been sexually abused, but most never talk about that, let alone talk about any of their problems. And when I speak in front of rooms, um, it's usually about 50-50 men and women. And I'll, and I'll ask the men of the room to raise their hand if they have one guy friend that they can open up to about anything. And if they, they talk about it once a, once a month about their problems, their challenges, their insecurities, their fears, one. Most of the room doesn't raise their hand. Maybe a couple guys do. And I say, are you guys a part of a church group that meets like once a month? And they kind of laugh and say, yeah. Where it's like a safe environment for men to talk about it. And I say, women, how many of you talk to a girlfriend once a day about your insecurities, your problems, your challenges, your fears, your doubts, your marital issues, whatever? And most of the women kind of laugh and raise their hand like every day, like a girlfriend or your mom or sister. Um, imagine doing this once a month, you know, what would that, how would that make you feel if you just didn't talk about these things? Imagine only doing it once a year. Imagine never doing it ever. How would it make you feel if you never were able to share your fears, your pains, your insecurities, your challenges? How would it make you feel? And kind of all the women laugh, kind of like joke and laugh. They're like, it would drive me crazy and I'd probably kill myself. And I'm like, hmm, you make a joke about it, but that's what men do. It drives them mad inside, and that's why men commit suicide way more than women. That's why there's, way, there's two million inmates in, in prison that are men, way more than, than women. And men suffer so much more with addiction, drugs, alcohol, to try to deal with the pain and the shame and the insecurity because they are not able to speak it to one human being without feeling like this person will not accept me, they'll make fun of me, they'll laugh at me, they'll beat me up, they'll kill me, whatever it is. And so it's just trying to allow people to go through a process of, again, mending the memories of the past because they're memories. And a lot of times we build the story up bigger than it was. I'm not saying it wasn't horrible or, or sad, but we tend to ruminate on the, the bad parts more. And when we can create new meaning and create peace from that meaning, then we are free. And so this has been the journey for me and it's, and it's a constant journey. Wow, that's so amazing. Oh, God. Do you think that people can do that then in while they're in a relationship? Because I'm really just projecting. Number one, I definitely think every woman listens to this, please, for the love of God, share it with your partner or share it with a guy in your life. Because even if it's a brother, right? Like, I just think what you're saying is so profound. And I so often take a female stance of like how we see things and how yeah. the struggles that we come from, uh, come with. And I've done so many relationship episodes where it's like, you know, the guy's broken my heart or he's, you know, like taken, you know, took advantage yeah. of me and Lied to me he and this used and that. me. Yeah. And so like, I'm very much about how, ladies, how do we make sure that we don't, um, that we don't just give ourselves over without having some steps, without setting mm -hmm. boundaries, like trying to really help women create um, boundaries for themselves to what you yeah. were saying about it, right? Like to, to show up in integrity. But the flip side of it for the guys, Honestly, I'm just as compassionate and just mm -hmm. as empathetic. And I I am so um, honored that you're talking about this on this show yeah. because I think it hopefully will help us not necessarily, like I said, point the finger and go, well, sure. he's just an asshole, right? Yeah. And then having that maybe compassion. Now, here's the problem, though, with that. It doesn't mean that you should just let them abuse you, 
be no. a bad boyfriend or, you know, have a... It may not be the right relationship, relationship anymore. Right, exactly. You might, when I got clear that this... No, I got clear mm -hmm. on what is the vision that I want for a relationship. What is my vision? I want a conscious relationship. And what does that mean? I want a relationship where when there is an argument or disagreement, we communicate consciously. That means there's no screaming. There's no passive aggressive energy. There's no... Uh, cold shoulder for even an hour or days, mm -hmm. which is what I experienced in every relationship. And I allowed it. So it's me, I wasn't living into my vision because I was wounded and afraid. And so the fear and the insecurity mm -hmm. and the wound caused me to act out of alignment with my vision. Mm -hmm. So once I got clear that my vision is to have a conscious relationship, that means conscious relationship with myself first. That means I must be in full ownership of who I am first before I can have a conscious relationship with someone else. That means conscious, conscious communication. That means conscious collaboration. That means conscious agreements. It's not, well, if you don't do this, then it's over. It's what are we agreeing to together? And can we have even a third party witness our agreements so that no one can say, I never said this mm -hmm. two years later. Oh, actually we did and we agreed on this. As opposed to this is the way it is and it's my way, the highway. Okay, well, if that's what someone else agrees to, cool. But this is a conscious relationship. This is the vision I have for my relationship. And you may be in a relationship that doesn't work and, and you can still heal in the relationship and create conscious relationship together, but you may find out you're not the right match for each other. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to face. I'm not telling people to break up. But what I'm saying, if you're a single, make sure you develop a conscious relationship with yourself and get clear on your relationship vision. I got super clear that this is the relationship I want to have before I met Martha. I said, this is what I want. This is what I'm creating. This is what it will take from me. You know, if I want to be these, uh, ha create this, I need to become it for myself as well. And then I need to be so clear that this is my boundaries and I'm not going to abandon myself. And so I was saying all these things with Martha when we got into our relationship and she was like, I love it. This is amazing. And here's where I'm coming from. And I said, cool, I accept that. But if she was like, you know, I want to I wanna have a different lifestyle or I want to live in, I don't know, Mexico full, full time. I'd be like, well, our lifestyle isn't in alignment with my vision. Mm. That doesn't mean you're a bad person or, you know, something's wrong with you. It just means we are out of alignment. And so can we create an agreement? I, am I okay with living in Mexico a month out of the year? And I have to check in and not abandon myself. If I'm not, I shouldn't be in this relationship. Isn't it funny how we convince ourselves that one of us is right and one of us is wrong? It's not about right and wrong. It's about are we aligned and a good match. But we do, though, in I those know. moments, if we haven't done the work like you're saying, yeah. of course, it ends up going to, but this is what I want. And We do that because we're afraid to be alone. And we want the other person to just give in to our fears and our needs. This is what I need. And if they're not going to do that, they don't care about me. They don't love me. They're not here for me. They're mm -hmm. selfish. Mm -hmm. And then we live in manipulation of someone else because we're afraid mm -hmm. and insecure. I suppose you're saying, okay, that's not what they want for their life. That's okay. Eight billion people. You don't need to force one person into your way. Uh, and I'm not saying like everything's going to be perfect sure, and everything's sure. going to be smooth the whole time, but it's finding as many agreements as possible to minimize frustration, to minimize arguments and anger and upset. That's mm -hmm. all it is. Mm -hmm. It's just being clear on here's my expectations and what I want to create. Is that your expectation? Cool. Now we have an agreement around this thing together. So we're clear. There's less stress around it. And I think a lot of people just don't have those conversations. And then uh, they didn't do this for me and they didn't do this for me. And it's like, are they supposed to? Mm -hmm. Were you clear about this? You know? <laughs> That's so true. You actually mentioned manipulation. How much did you have to look at how your girlfriends were manipulating and you manipulating them. It may I'm be inadvertently sometimes. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure we are both manipulating each other. Again, when you're wounded, you're, you're in some type of, I don't know if it's, I don't think it was like uh, intentional manipulation. It was like wounded mm. and your fears are just causing you to be less conscious. And so you need to protect yourself. You need someone to not do something they did so you feel safe. Mm -hmm. It's a form of manipulation because you're not comfortable with who you are. So you're needing someone to change to make you happy. Mm -hmm. Where I don't need Martha to change at all. 
I am happy, she is happy. We come together to add to our happiness. But when we get in a relationship, not being a happy human being and expecting someone else to do everything in order to make us feel safe and protected and meet our needs, that's just the wrong way of going about it. We need to meet our own needs mm -hmm. and fulfill our own happiness and support the other person in their needs, but not be their needs. Mm -hmm. That is a recipe for pain. Dude, that's so powerful. And this is the one thing that I'm like repeating over and over. It's like, no, you may not need a man, but you want a man. Yeah. Like, why can't you just say what you want? And right, and it's like, we so worry about if I say that I need something, am I appearing needy? Um, so that means I shouldn't ask for it at all. But instead, yeah. like just actually own that you want it. Yeah, I think exactly. It's not about needing, I don't need, a relationship. I want a conscious, healthy, loving, abundant relationship. That's what I want. Yeah. So that I'm not going to jump into a relationship that isn't that. Mm. I'm not going to be in that. It again, it doesn't mean there's not going to be adversities of life. Right, sure. But the intention is to build a relationship that wants to create that. That is the vision of our relationship. If I needed a relationship to feel loved, then that's the wrong way to go about mm. it. I get to feel loved and be loved first. I get to love my life first. And I didn't fully love myself in previous relationships and they didn't fully love themselves. Mm -hmm. And so we were just two wounded people in every relationship of, I need this, you need that, you don't make me happy, I'm scared, you're jealous because we're wounded. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a process of, you know, and maybe that works for people, but that's just not what I wanted anymore. Is that where the fireworks come from? Because there's so many people in relationships and you're smiling because <laughs> I'm guessing that you've had yeah. this, where it's like, it's when you argue, it's shit is hit in the fan, yeah. the house is burning down. And then as soon as it's over, it's over. You make out and you have sex like yeah. rabbits. And, and then you, you sweep it under the rug and you repeat it two weeks exactly. later. Exactly. <sighs> Man, it's just a lot. I mean, again, is that the wound? I, I raised though? my hand because this was most of my life. Mm. Uh, so I have compassion and empathy because this is who I once was. But it's just a lot of trauma bonding. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of heightened emotions when there's traumas that you're bonding to mm -hmm. with someone else. Or when someone is there to fulfill a trauma that you need fixed, a hole that you need met, uh, filling. And if it doesn't be met consistently, then it's more trauma and more energy and more fighting and explosion. Mm -hmm. But what I've learned is, uh, for me, that doesn't bring harmony to my life. When there's explosions and fighting and fires, that is not harmony. You're burning yourself down emotionally, up and down, up and down. It's a lot of wasted energy. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. And it's not the life or the vision I have for a conscious relationship. Again, if that's the relationship and the life you want, then know that comes with certain consequences. That comes with arguments, that comes with mistrust, that comes with your partner going out and you being jealous and insecure and then fighting and then making up and this whole cycle. That's just not the life I want anymore. It's wasted energy. And when you're clear on your mission and your purpose, which is the first step in my book, which is about getting clear on a meaningful mission, you want to eliminate anything that doesn't support the mission because mm -hmm. you realize I could be gone any moment. This life can be fractured in any moment. And why am I wasting so much energy going up and down, up and down with one person where we're out of alignment? It's really about alignment. Doesn't mean they're wrong or bad. Doesn't mean they're right and good. It means are you aligned? And do you want the best for the other person? If you want the best for them, why would you get upset at them? Why would you scream at them if you want the best for them? If you truly love them in a conscious level, why would you scream consistently and say, you did this wrong? This wrong to what? Unless you've agreed on it, there's nothing wrong. Them living their life. So if they did something, if Martha cheated on me, I would not scream at her. I would be sad, I would be hurt, I would be disappointed and let down, I'd feel a wide range of emotions, but what does screaming do for me? What does it do for the moment? What does holding a grudge against someone do for me and my mission? It pulls me away from my mission, it pulls me away from my health and my harmony with myself. I may have moments of needing to release and let go, I may need to process it, I may need to you know, do my own techniques to really get out the emotion of anger or sadness or frustration, but 
me screaming at someone over and over for what they did to me, that, that only goes so far. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying, is it useful towards my life? And I want peace and harmony. That is my highest currency, is peace, harmony. And it's just creating a life that supports me with that as much as possible. Um, so I've processed all of this as well. And I used to be the girl that when in my first relationship before Tom, I was with a guy for about three to four years and it was very manipulative. It was very, you know, like screaming yeah. and then, yeah. you know, the, the hot sex, all of that stuff. Uh -huh. And so um, what I realized was when I started to do the work, yes. like what you're saying, right? You start to get utter clarity in your behavior, in how you're show up, showing up. And then you start to go, well, huh? Why am I doing that? And so when I started, when I met Tom and we started really working on our relationship and he was the man for me, I realized that I was using crying and tears as a manipulation. manipulation. Yeah. It's true. And I realized that. And so what I started to do is I actually started to walk out of the room when I started to cry to the point where he's like, babe, why can't you cry in front of me? Mm. And I would say to him, because in a moment where we're arguing, if I was upset about something else, I'd happily cry in front of him. But in the moment of me and him arguing, my emotional state says cry. But in that moment, I know what it's doing to him. And the truth is, is I don't want him to back down because he feels bad that I'm upset. Because then he's got to give it and take care of exactly. you. Exactly. Yeah. And I know that doesn't serve our relationship. So if I know that, that him backing off doesn't serve our relationship, I don't want to manipulate yeah. him with my tears. So I've said to him, sometimes I actually need to walk away so I can cry, yeah. so I can process how you've impacted me. And then I can come back and articulate it to you yeah. instead of using the tears to yeah. kind of make you act in I a think certain that's, way. I think that's wise. And I also want to point out that you know, you should be, I think women should be uh, open to cry in front of, course, of their men. Of course, yeah, absolutely. But I think when it happens on like every three days because you didn't get something you wanted and there's a breakdown, then it starts to feel like a little bit manipulative mm -hmm. in that sense where it's, the man doesn't feel like he can actually say what's on his mind. He just has to take care of you. And he wants you to be happy. You know, the man wants you to be happy. He doesn't want you to be sad and crying. Right. No man lives their life thinking, I hope my woman cries today and right. is mad at me. Yeah. That doesn't happen. It's not an intentional no. act. And so, and I know from our last conversation, um, you know, you said you hadn't cried in a long time. This was about a year and a half. Yeah. Year, year and a half ago, I think. You were like, I haven't cried in a long time. I, I, think you, I think you said, I don't remember the last time I cried. I've really been working on it. And so I've really like, even on this episode, I was, see, I was allowing myself, but it's a conscious effort. <laughs> it's a bloody conscious effort. Well, when you effort. block something for so long, thousand, you've got to be conscious about it. Yeah. You've got to allow yourself to feel. I think part of it also was my ex-boyfriend, where uh, I was like, no man's ever going to see me cry never again. Never hurt me again. Right, right, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. 100%. And how's that show for you? <laughs> yeah, didn't quite how's work, that working right? for you? <laughs> so I mean, it, it works in certain external results, but it, it doesn't give you the internal harmony that you truly want long term. Oh, okay. So here's the truth. As a businesswoman, it does serve me. 100%. It serves me to be able to regulate my emotions. And in my um, personal life, I've used it to then be able to serve me, the emotional yeah. regulation thing. So that is super important. But then let's talk about also guys. Sometimes it serves guys to walk in and be an alpha male and to be strong and to put your chest out, right? Depending on what you're trying to retrieve, yeah. it could be useful. Football, right? Yeah, you course. walk out on the pitch. If you walk with your head like hung and you kind of don't look confident. You're you're, on, you're losing. So I understand why it can yeah. actually serve you. But also, it then can absolutely not serve you with if you walk into a relationship, right, with your chest pushed out and you, you do that with a woman, I think that that would end up causing yeah. some friction and, yeah. you know, in, intimidation, which I don't think is healthy. Well, here's the thing. I've heard so many times over and over again that women want their husbands or their partners, their men in their lives to be more vulnerable with them. I've heard this many, many times yeah, yeah. over the last five, six years since I got into the mask and masculinity work. And then I would be, you know, men would come to me and say, okay, Lewis, like I'm going to go and I'm going to finally be vulnerable with my wife. I'm going to find, she's been asking me for years and I'm too closed off. I'm too stoic. I don't show emotion. I never am sensitive. And I've always felt like I've had to protect the family. I've had to make sure I'm taking care of things and making sure she's taken care of. And I've got to be in a different state. I can't be sensitive in those moments, but I'm going to try it. 
And then they go and try and they let their guard down in sense of opening their heart. They start to feel a little sensitive or when there's a breakdown, they allow themselves to process and cry in front of their woman. And a lot of them have come back to me and said, she's not able to receive it with me being vulnerable. She can't see me cry. It, tur it turned her off. She felt afraid. She felt like I wasn't protecting her and all these things. So when a man feels like a woman is actually going against them when they're being vulnerable, they're, never, they're gonna say, never again am I gonna show vulnerabilities with my woman again. If she can't handle it, why would I do this? She's been telling me for years she wants this. I'm doing it and she can't handle it. Then men were gonna go back into, up. Oh, I'm just gonna take care of things. I'm gonna be the protector and provider and I'm not gonna show emotion. And so I also think it's important for women to really take a look in the mirror and say, can I receive my man if he cries in front of me? Mm -hmm. Can I receive him? In a previous relationship, I cried once and she laughed at me laughed at me. And I remember saying, thank God I'm confident enough in myself that I'm going to keep crying in a movie or in a sad time or whatever. I'm going to keep crying because I don't care if she cries at me. I don't care. When but if I, if I wasn't at a place where I was confident in myself yet, I'd be mm -hmm. like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm never going to cry again. Oh, you're right. If you're, if you're laughing at me, why would I cry? And so you've got to be I think women get the opportunity to be conscious as well and say, could I truly, if my man of 10 years that I'm married to or my boyfriend of two years who I've never seen cry, if he cried, I mean like a little tear or an ugly cry, could I be a loving presence for him and would I actually be love him more? Would I be more turned on? Would I be excited about having an emotionally evolved man in my life and not just a single emotion man? Mm -hmm. Would that excite me or would it scare me? And if it scares you, then you gotta take a look in the mirror because you're influencing, I'm not saying it's, you know, it's a man's responsibility, but you're influencing a man to be closed off more. And more closed off men cause more harm. Mm -hmm. So you just gotta ask yourself, what is inside of me that doesn't, isn't, isn't allowing for, for a man to be emotional in front of me? And I get it's all timing and situations and you wanna be aware of that, but just ask yourself that. Again, it's not right or wrong, but if, if women want men to be more emotionally vulnerable and sensitive, they've gotta be able to receive it mm -hmm. with care and not make fun of them, not look down on it, and not think they're weak when they're sensitive. God, this is such a trick. I thank you. I love this conversation because it's very tricky. I can actually imagine in that moment, right, where the woman is like, she laughs at you, like, we can dismiss her. What a fucking bitch. Mm. Like, how can she right. be so mean? But at the same but time- I have compassion for it too. What if she was brought up with a father that was super stoic and I in that moment- compassion. Where she's just actually like, oh shit, I don't know how to respond. And her reaction exactly. of laughing is automatic, but not because she actually finds it right. funny. It's funny because we had a conversation like, I don't know, an, after, a year, uh, an hour afterwards. And she goes, listen, I know I'm not supposed to laugh, and think it's weak, but just I've been so conditioned to think that a man crying is weak. And I, I was just like in shock that you cried. And again, it doesn't mean it's okay or it's right or any of these things, but I am able to look from, from out of myself and have compassion for that because I know that her father left her when she was younger and she never felt like she trusted any men. And, she, and all these things. So it doesn't mean it's okay, and it doesn't no. mean it's, but it's just, all right, this is where you're at in your, le in your level of your relationship mm -hmm. and what you, how you respond to vulnerability. And it was another reason why I was like, okay, this relationship isn't for me, you know? Um, this happened in multiple previous relationships. You know, it's like, when mm -hmm. I would be vulnerable, I would get made fun of, laughed, or wouldn't be received well by almost every woman that I've been with. Wow. Uh, and so, Again, why would men open up and be vulnerable if they're going to get laughed at, if they're not going to be received well, if they're going to be made fun of? It doesn't feel good. And so I'm, I'm calling out to all women listening and watching. Figure out what it is. Inside. I know you say you want your man to be more sensitive and vulnerable, but when it happens, you've got to really honor the space. Honor the sacredness of your man being vulnerable if he's never been vulnerable. Lean in, comfort him, guide him. You don't have to say anything, just hold him, touch him. Say, I'm here for you, I got you, you're safe. 
Because a man doesn't feel safe typically when he's vulnerable, if he's not been trained on how to feel safe mm -hmm. in that environment. So allow your man to release decades of pain in front of you. It might be a small tear. It might be a moment of something, but that moment could open his heart and start the process of healing and bringing harmony to the relationship. Mm. God, I think it's because, um, if I can just project of why women may get uncomfortable when a guy is vulnerable, because I actually think it's very important. There's so much fear that we've been conditioned as women to see men as the stoicness, yeah. as the person that's gonna save me. Now, here's the tricky thing, Lewis. I absolutely want my husband to save me. Someone's breaking into the house. So- 100%, so, it's, it's situational. Yeah, but-, but You wanna what, feel safe when there's you know an attack. Yes. But when there's a, a sensitive moment and, I and you're on the couch and there's something coming up for you, yeah. there's no one attacking you, you've got to allow the man to let, let his guard down and be vulnerable. Correct, and I think what we yeah. end up doing is going, oh, he's vulnerable, shit, he can't save me from he the person. He can't take care of me, he, he can't, can't pay the bills, he can't provide for me, all these things. And here's the thing, it's not, I, I think, it's just the confusion we yes. have that it has to be one or the 100%, other. 100%, I get it. Even when I talk to Tom about my own career, right? It's like, I was, this, you know, I was a stay-at-home wife for eight years. I was taking care of yeah. him, clothes out and cooking for him. I wanted four children. And now I don't cook for him at all and I never do the laundry. So it's like, I had evolved, but mm -hmm. what he prided himself on is that we're the couple that can navigate A, changes, yes. but also navigate masculine and femin yes. feminine to the point where if you think of masculine and feminine as being a spectrum, right? I'm actually more in the middle. Mm -hmm. I can bounce between being more masculine and being more feminine. Yeah. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. And so no, can Tom. Yeah. And so because we both can, we actually understand when he's standing in his feminine or he's standing in his masculine and then vice versa. Yes, yes. And now it's not an either or. It's not, well, hang on a minute. If he's vulnerable, it means he can't protect me. Or if he's protecting me, then he can't be vulnerable. Exactly. And I think, you know, women just got to learn how to process that and, and receive that and know that. Now, listen, if your man's like in breakdown every day and crying constantly, then you, you may be some concern there and he may need some support in getting out of that. Mm -hmm. But just the normal range of emotions that human beings have mm -hmm. and f laughing, loving, crying. You know, if you don't feel like you're capable of doing that, you're shutting something off inside of you. If you don't feel safe with your most intimate partner who's supposed to love and accept you the mm -hmm. most, if you're not accepted by them, then who in the world will accept you? So imagine the fears and insecurities that are tied to that if you're the person you give the most trust to cannot receive your emotions. And I'm not saying screaming emotions and hysterical emotions and anger emotions. I'm saying like your vulnerabilities, mm. your sadness, like your, your, your fears, you know what I mean? And I just think that's something we can all work on. Men receiving their women better, women receiving their men better. But it, it starts with looking at yourself, facing yourself first. And especially if you, like your story where you were saying that you were brought up with parents that weren't necessarily like emotionally intelligent yeah. enough to be able to help guide you. And I believe they were 20 years old when they had- They were 19 first. when they had 19. my brother. I mean, yeah. yeah, again, they didn't know how to love each other. So thinking about yeah. that and then thinking about you as this little five-year-old Lewis, um, Anytime if you even became vulnerable, I can only assume you were either mocked, put down, you know, for I, I was very sensitive growing up, but then I would be made fun of, laughed at, picked out in school and sports. And that caused me to say, I want to fit in. I want to belong. I want to be accepted. So it might, means I got to be tough. I got to yeah, be strong. Yeah. I can't show emotion. And I almost need to dominate others in sports mm. to show how worthy I am, right? So I need to be bigger, faster, stronger. And when I tackle someone, I need to really make them feel pain so that they never want to get up. Mm. When I, you know, dunk on someone, I need to make sure that I give them an extra elbow when I fall down to make sure they don't mess with me. Mm. Whatever it is, I need to make sure that I have full force and dominance in sports. Mm. And this win-lose min mindset is always a lose-lose. There's no winner in that. I don't win anything from that. I might win the game, but I lose the lesson and I lose my, my harmony and my peace inside of me. I might make a lot of money and build a business, but then at what price to my peace and to my harmony? And so I'm just, my whole goal is to figure out how to keep unwinding this because it's gonna be a process forever. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna continue to make mistakes. I'm gonna continue to be out of integrity, but the goal is to stay as conscious as possible, 
have the accountability and the support as frequently as possible to stay on track yeah. and stay in harmony. You had a quote that really hit me, and it's really important, again, that I understand men and where they come from. And this quote really hit me. The problem is that toughness doesn't stop, and it grows like cancer until it strangles all other feelings. Mm. I was like, oh, God, I've never thought of toughness as being like yeah. that. And then when, with everything we're talking about, understanding when you were younger, the vulnerability, you were teased, mocked, bullied for it. Okay, so you got tough. And now in that tough... And then I had a lot of anger. You had to, but I'm sure in those moments, people are now showing you more respect. They're kind of like yeah. getting more, quote unquote, in line. And so the toughness is actually teaching you a lesson, a false lesson, but it was teaching you a lesson. Yeah. And then in that journey for 25, 30 years, no wonder you were your feelings were strangled. Yeah. Yeah, I was out of integrity with myself internally yeah. because I was getting external results living one way, but not getting the internal results of peace and harmony and alignment. Mm. Because I was living in anger, resentment, and a lack of forgiveness from all the things from the past. And a, a feeling of, I'm never gonna let anyone abuse me, take advantage of me, or abandon me again. So if this ever comes up and I'm triggered, I'm gonna block myself so it never happens. Mm -hmm. As opposed to just saying, life is going to happen. People are going to do what they do. I can interpret it as abandonment and abuse, or I can interpret it as something else of this and not take it personally. And I can create new meaning from the events that are occurring. It doesn't mean I have to like something. I might be disappointed still, but I don't need to be angry about it all. That doesn't serve my mission or my health. So again, I go back to priority one and two, health and mission. If it's not useful for my health, why am I allowing it to consume and create a cancer inside of me? So again, doesn't mean I'm this perfect human being. I'm gonna be upset and angry at times. But it's, human. but it's allowing me, it's, that's why I have coaching and accountability every couple of weeks to get me back on track, to process it, to talk about it, to get it out. I didn't like this thing. Okay, let's get it out and get back to vision. Get back to your mission. Get back to who you are, which is a loving, passionate, wise, conscious human being. And that takes consistent practice. Oh, dude, mic drop right there. Where can people find you and all the amazing things you do and your amazing, but the greatness mindset. The greatest mindset. Um, you can get it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or anywhere you want to get your books. School of Greatness podcast and Lewis Howes anywhere on social media. All right, guys, if you're not subscribed, click that subscribe button down there. And until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace. Click here right now to learn how to find and keep true love. They've had bad breakups. They've dated the wrong person. They've struggled with connection. Maybe they've been abused, whatever it may be. And one question I'd always ask people is,